Hello, and welcome to my podcast called Faith is Strength. I'm Nochi Mendel, speaking out of Irmont, New York, helping spread the beautiful light of spirituality across the world. The date of this recording is April 4th, 2017. May my words and the expressions of my soul be gratifying to everyone who hears them. I pray that my words help pave a beautiful path in your journey of life. Thank you for tuning in. Thank you for being part of this. And thank you for existing. Existing. Did you ever think about that? Have you ever thought of thanking your spouse, your brother, your friend, your mother, or anyone else you are close with for existing? What a blessing it is to have people that we love and connect with, to travel along with on our journey through life. Thank you, Hashem. God is so good to us. I find it so conducive to dedicate a full recording on the topic of approaching spirituality with balance. It's such an important subject that I'm surprised it hasn't gotten the attention it deserves. The difference between beginning your journey correctly and starting it incorrectly is the difference between walking off the roof of a building and taking the stairs. They are a world apart. They are life and death. Though it may not seem so, individuals who approach spirituality incorrectly or with improper guidance actually end up creating more problems for themselves than they appear to have solved. Sure, the beginning feels good. Beginnings usually do. The culture shock alone will draw you into experience. You may feel happy, fulfilled, even euphoric. But after some time, once the initial high wears off, there will lie the true path you decided to take. That's when you'll know if you are truly ordained with kosher spirituality. If you approached spirituality with improper guidance, you will know it, because you will find yourself regressing in degrees you can't imagine. You may find yourself in a lower place in life than when you previously started. Why? Because only truth prevails. Only proper kosher guidance holds up and weather is all storms. We will talk about this truth shortly. I speak with so much conviction because I've watched this occur too many times. It isn't something I dreamt up. It's something I've lived. It's a part of growth that I've seen and helped others through. I don't really know how to effectively point out and stress the importance of this subject in words. But I will say this, for every person finding stability and peace of mind in their spiritual journey, there are probably 100 who don't. And that number may actually be on the conservative side. Millions of people struggle every day trying to make sense of the many different spiritual teachings they've learned. Apparent contradictions, trials and tribulations, the evil inclination, and so many more elements tend to seep through the cracks and take hold of the person's daily activities and mindset. But where did that begin? When did that start? These people believed in their new practice and outlook just like you, my beloved brothers and sisters. They too had a time in life when things made perfect sense. Their youthful imagination ran wild with ideas of spiritual awareness mindfulness, expounded consciousness, and closeness with God. So how exactly did they lose touch and slip into what they now call reality? What knocked them off their high horse? The answer is not so simple, and with God's love and grace, I hope to be blessed with proper inspiration and clarity so that I can relay this message correctly. Hear me out, because I too have first-hand experience with this phenomenon. 
but in God's infinite mercy, I did approach spirituality with balance. I was exposed to and guided by kosher sources, and as a result, I have the understanding to speak about this and share my experiences with others. So let's crack this bottle open. I have a strong desire to get this message out and to get it out in such a way that it is understood significantly. With this in mind, I am aware that when individuals are stuck in a bad place, it can be hard for true knowledge or healthy perspective to penetrate their protective bubble. In light of that, I'm going to use some very direct language in an attempt to get through to those most in need. Having said all of that, I'll jump right into it. Part 1. Balance. What is balance? The definition of the word balance with respect to how I want to use it would be, and I quote, a condition in which different elements are equal or in the correct proportions. But obviously this idea requires much elaboration because if the quoted literal definition was sufficient, I wouldn't have to dedicate a whole podcast to this subject. So let's get into the nitty gritty of my idea of balance. Let's really come to understand the practical details of this subject. This is how I have come to understand my own idea of balance. There are rules and there are ingredients. They may seem the same, but intrinsically play slightly different roles. First I will list the ingredients of balance. There are three primary ones. Number one is taking baby steps. Number two is being open to other people's outlooks. And number three is not gravitating to the extreme. As you can see, the word balance sums up all three ingredients in one. Balance is a tool, but that tool should become a part of a person's principles and values as a human. The goal is for it to become interwoven into a person's soul and the very fabric of their being. One should live, breathe, and be balanced. Here are the three rules for balance. Number one, when pursuing balance, make sure it doesn't interfere with the Torah. The Torah always comes first, so don't attempt to use the logic of balance if it will go against the Torah. Of course, this should go without saying, but for some reason I feel the need to mention it anyway. Number two, don't be so open-minded that your brain falls out. Balance requires core values and principles. Don't lose yours. Number three is not to confuse balance with anything other than what it's defined to be. Not that you can't apply it to unspecified areas of your life. In fact, the opposite is true. I recommend that you apply it to unspecified areas of your life. I just don't want my idea of balance to be used as an excuse for something inappropriate. An example of that would be to use balance as an excuse to agree with ideas or actions that clearly go against your morals, values, or principles. Never neglect your ethics, or as I've stated, don't go against the Torah in your pursuit of balance. The true nature of balance works hand-in-hand hand with the Torah or any other set of values a person may have, for that matter. Balance is comprised of various spiritual ideas all wrapped in one. I just find it to be an appropriate term that is all-encompassing with regards to its subject application. The reward of using balance is infinite but if I were forced to list a number of its benefits, I'd start with this. Number one, consistency of growth. Number two, humility. Number three, open-mindedness. Number four, and most important of all, healthy spiritual growth. As you can see, we have three lists that fully define my idea of balance. The first list is the actual ingredients of balance. The second list is the rules of balance. While the third list covers the rewards of balance. 
being mindful of all these elements will help you incorporate them into your being. Part 2. The Benefits of Balance If you think I'm done, you're wrong. I'm just getting started. I'm going to dive into each of these four main benefits and see why balance is so rewarding. Number 1. The Consistency of Growth Not only should balance be used in approaching spirituality overall, but balance and baby steps should be employed in every aspect of life, which will result in healthy, positive growth. Number two, humility. By utilizing balance, you are intrinsically being humble. How? Because you are not getting ahead of yourself. You are not being too proud or arrogant. On the contrary, you are being modest and realistic about your growth. Number three, open-mindedness is a big part of balance. As I've already mentioned, you have to be open to other people's outlooks. So by living a balanced life, you are teaching yourself to be more open-minded. Number four, healthy spiritual growth. In essence, this benefit is a mere byproduct of the last two qualities. Because if a person is humble and open-minded, then by default they are growing while maintaining a healthy state of mind. That doesn't mean that the individual is being taught or attracted to kosher teachings though. That's why we have number three on the list of ingredients which is not gravitating toward the extreme. In essence, balance is a practice that helps counter extremism on many different levels. Oh gosh, not extremism. Yep, I couldn't help it. <laughs> I thought about this long and hard and concluded that I cannot avoid the topic of extremism in this podcast. Initially, I really did want to refrain from slipping into the topic of extremism because I really think that it deserves a podcast of its own. And perhaps I will dedicate a podcast to it one day. But it seems that its relevance to this subject is too strong and unavoidable. But before I go there, hold my hand as I walk you through a part of my journey. I'm going to share my personal experiences to try and point out some very important processes. But do note that although I find it natural to use my own experiences as an example, I'm confident that most people who go through the same and similar circumstances will experience the same thing. Part 3. Personal Experiences I'm 24 years young with about 5 or 6 years of spiritual life under my belt. I'm not bragging, just stating facts. 6 years is not very long, but from another perspective, it is very long. The latter perspective would be taking into account where I came from, what I've been through, things I've been exposed to, and many more variables. Over my six years of spiritual living, I've grounded myself in marriage, child rearing, business, fitness, and many more aspects of life. When I began my spiritual journey, I was completely void of spiritual knowledge. Well, not exactly because I did have lengthy discussions with my beloved grandmother about God, love, and life just a few years prior, but there was no dot. In other words, there was no applied knowledge. It was just some scattered ideas buried beneath the crust of my ice-cold surface. I did seem to have a good intuition when it came to spiritual conversations, but it never blossomed. Nobody ever watered the plant. Prior to my approach to spirituality, I never thought about God, existence, or purpose in life enough to make an informed decision. Yes, I've thought and even argued about some of the topics that I just mentioned, but those thoughts and beliefs never materialized into life decisions or a lifestyle. I simply believed in God, but was not religious. I believe that religion is poisonous and that you do not need any organized religion in order to live a healthy, meaningful life. Then came young adulthood. As I turned 17 or 18, meaning and purpose in life began to naturally creep into my mind. It consumed my essence 
and there began my journey into the spiritual world. It all started with me listening to some lectures. To be perfectly honest, I don't remember if my first lesson in spirituality was from a Laser Brody CD or Rhonda Burns' The Secret. I do recall this, however. I listened to one CD, which sparked my soul. From there, I researched and learned more and more about spirituality nonstop. The first year was a tight mixture of Jewish and secular teachings. It was this that led me to dig deeper into the religious aspects of Judaism again, and I found my place. I found my home. I finally understood Judaism from a spiritual and philosophical standpoint. Not knowing myself growing up, there was no way for me or anyone else to know that these approaches would solve my soul's instability. Besides, I didn't really attend the type of school that probes each individual child for their particular aptitudes and interests. But I don't want to get too carried away with details, so let's jump right into the point of me mentioning this period in my life. I had just approached spirituality. To my sheer luck, I was exposed to proper guidance. But wait, I don't believe in luck. Let's call it destiny. God blessed me with good guidance, with positive motivators, and with intellectually honest people who would ultimately shape the very beginning of my spiritual journey. That's not to say that I wasn't exposed to the opposite. In fact, I was, very much so. The newcomer to spirituality finds his or herself scouring the web and bumping into all kinds of nonsensical garbage that may come across as very appealing and convincing but I always had the clarity and intuition to steer clear. In retrospect, here's an accurate account of what transpired from that point until now with regards to our specific topic at hand. The first lesson that I listened to on matters of spirituality opened my eyes. A mixture of confusion, revelation, and possibility. It's like my soul knew intrinsically that what I was hearing was the truth. As my beloved grandmother calls it, our soul having deja vu. This alone is a very trippy phenomenon in spirituality. Bear with me as I delve into this a bit. You might love what you're about to hear. The soul, as mentioned in my last podcast, is a spark of God, literally. Meaning it is limitless, all-knowing, and not bound by physical limitation. Combine that with the philosophical idea that there is no past, present, or future, and we're left with a soul that theoretically may already know everything that your body will only come to learn with the illusion of time. That means that when you learn something that appears new, your soul already knows it. This may also be in relation to the Jewish belief that all of Torah is learned and forgotten prior to descending to this world. Isn't this awesome? This means that if you are in touch with your body and soul, or the more you are in touch with your body and soul, the more likely you are to notice the soul's remembering of new information. I find that so cool, especially because I've experienced it so many times in my life. When we learn something truthful, our soul recognizes it as such but it's a very subtle realization. So when I started to learn about spirituality, I was in a state of yes, yes, yes. It's like my body was uniting with my soul's existing knowledge or inner being. Anyway, so the first couple lessons were all about learning something new, but not new at all. It was like I was invited home, my comfort zone, my purpose. After that came the desire to learn more and more. This is the first step that so many people are blessed to experience. Part 4. The Spiritual High The spiritual high is a gift. It is of paramount importance that we understand this well. The spiritual high that we get when we begin our spiritual journey is a gift from God. 
It's like God saying, welcome home, my child. Make yourself at home. Have a look around. The thing about this high is that it is a tease or a taste. It doesn't last forever. From my experience, this high lasts for most people between one and two years, which was the case for me. However, there are times when it may last two to four years. Very rarely does this high last perpetually. For most people, it comes to an end. Coming to understand this in a defined way should not discourage you in any way. Neither should you stop anything you're doing because you know it will end. The high should be taken advantage of in ways you can't imagine. But I'll get to that shortly. The reason I'm defining your awesome experience in a very practical way is to help you. How can this knowledge help you, you may ask? I'll tell you. Since you are now aware of the fact that it will most likely wear off, you must ask yourself, how will you deal with it? What will you feel then? How will your journey progress when you're not tripping? How will you connect with God when you're feeling down and unmotivated? All these questions and subsequent answers are exactly why this knowledge can help you. When I began my spiritual journey and was blessed with the spiritual high, I didn't think it would end. I believe most people think to themselves that it will be like this forever. What's the big deal? I'll just continue doing what I'm doing and I'll always feel this way. Yep, these are very familiar thoughts. I didn't have anyone to warn me that it ends. In fact, I'll take it one step further. Not only did I not think the high would ever stop, I could not understand people who believed in the same awesome stuff as me and weren't high. I couldn't understand or relate to the people who cried or couldn't deal with tribulations. I could not understand why my mentors talked so much about trials and tribulations in life. I felt so good, so high and connected. There's hardly any significant trials or tribulations when you are that connected. Or at least, hardly any trials or tribulations that you can't easily cope with when you're that connected. I simply did not get it. But before I knew it, I did get it. I was knocked off my high horse. I found myself in a state of being, in a stage of life, which I couldn't understand just one year prior. I found myself 2.5 years into my spiritual journey, battling with the trials and tribulations that I couldn't understand. I became what I learned so much about. How's that for law of attraction? But to my great blessing, I listened and learned. I focused and took in a lot of knowledge and learned an untold amount of tools to deal with my new struggles. That is why I was able to cope, pull through, and stabilize. What would have happened had I not spent hundreds of hours listening to kosher spirituality and gained proper guidance during my high? I would have rebounded to somewhere lower than before. But I did have good guidance. I was versed in kosher, effective spiritual ideas, and therefore, with Hashem's help, I was able to utilize all these amazing things to keep me on track. What do we learn from this? Two things. First, as I've already said, the high comes to an end. You will be knocked around once the initial high passes. If life and spiritual living were so easy and euphoric without fail, then everyone would be practicing it or consuming it like a drug. But it's not that easy. The practical day-to-day -day is not that glorious. Remember this clearly. Nothing good comes easy. This is not some cute quote said to dismiss genuine interest. This quote has deep spiritual significance. Everything good and lasting has to be worked for. One of the only free good things that we get in this respect is the initial high, the welcome home gift. After that, it's all hard work. Of course, we are gifted with an untold amount of things from Hashem every second of the day, like our heartbeat, 
eyesight, hearing, but I'm talking about physical, spiritual, and emotional achievements. They all require hard work. So again, the first thing is that the high comes to an end and hard work must begin. The second thing we learned from my personal account is that if you don't spend hundreds of hours accumulating kosher spiritual knowledge, you can't cope with being knocked down. For me, it was only by virtue of the proper teachings, dedication, and hard work that I was able to stabilize after my high. This second element is the answer to what you should be doing with your high. Remember when I mentioned that you have to take advantage of the high in ways you can't imagine? This is what I was referring to. You must utilize the energy of this high to accumulate a wealth of kosher spiritual knowledge and tools. It is so easy to get carried away by the pure physical stimulation of the high and forget to glean from its fruits appropriately. I believe the proper way to glean from this gift is by utilizing its awesome energy to learn kosher spirituality as much as you can. For all I know, Hashem gives us that high solely for that purpose. What do we know? You showed interest in God. You wanted to find that connection? Well, here's a high. The high has so much energy that you now have the patience to learn every spiritual tool that you will need in the future when the high is taken away. The high will be ending regardless. But if you don't take advantage of the opportunity and have nothing to continue after the high is gone, then you basically wasted a once-in-a-lifetime free pass. What do I mean? Well, for people who are not spiritually high, finding the patience, motivation, and drive to sit and learn is itself a major hurdle. It isn't easy. We lack the day-to-day -day energy that we need in order to learn all day about God and spirituality. That precise energy is what's showered upon a newbie. That means that you have something that can potentially secure your successful spiritual life for the rest of your life. But if you pass up on it, if you use the high to trip on mundane things, you will be faced with having to find the motivation to learn spirituality on your own. That's if you even have the desire for that once the high wears down. So as you can see, the high is a gift, a powerful energy from God that you can take very significant and needed advantage of. It would be my greatest gift to you if you heed my words and utilize it. I personally, without knowing it, spent my spiritual high learning and soaking up as much knowledge as I could. It's a blessing that I'll be forever grateful for. I could not imagine what my struggles would be like once my high wore down without all my knowledge. I often see others in that unfortunate predicament. It's not pretty. Everyone who we can help avoid that predicament will be eternally grateful. Now that we understand those two processes of the high, I'm going to touch on the topic of extremism a bit and explain why balance at its core is there to counter it. What is extremism? Well, to be perfectly honest, extremism in relation to religious belief and practice is a very intricate subject and a hard term to define. But I don't think it's necessary for the sake of this podcast to get caught up in the details. I'll do that another time. For now, let's just work with some basic, universally accepted definitions and see why balance counters it. Part 5. Extremism Extremism is a tendency or disposition to go to extremes, especially in political or religious matters. How does that apply to individuals beginning their spiritual journey? It actually applies to everyone who begins any journey in every facet of life. But in regards to approaching spirituality, there seems to be a prevalent and even toxic tendency to A. Be attracted to extreme teachings or B. Become an extremist. Both complement each other. 
you may wonder, well, what are extreme teachings, or isn't all of Judaism extreme? I already mentioned that the term extremism is intricate when applied to religion. However, there is a common consensus which does not hinder the nuances that will be discussed at a later date, which is, the term extremism is mostly used for an ideology that is considered to be far outside the acceptable mainstream attitudes of society. Now, if we apply that to the pondering individual who just began his or her spiritual journey, we get a picture that can look a few different ways. All begin with how the individual is turned onto or introduced to spirituality. Some people take a drug and it broadens their horizons. Indeed, psychedelics has been known to expand people's intellectual horizons. Others, like myself, may spontaneously bump into a CD or a book on spirituality and connect with it for various logical or emotional reasons. Still, others may have been introduced to spirituality through an individual. If that was the case, it matters who the individual is and what their intentions are. Let's deal with one case at a time. The individual who has a spiritual awakening due to drugs or other mind-altering substances. This introduction to spirituality may be warm and welcoming. It has potential, like all others, but of course individuals in this category need to question whether or not their spiritual revelations and feelings have a dependency on the substance they took. Meaning, how will you proceed? If drugs opened your mind to the beauties of the spiritual dimension, what will you do after that awakening? Will you attempt to tap into that place without drugs and create consistency? Or will you draw on the substance that gave you that initial high? The challenge here is that the individual who was introduced to spirituality on drugs will actually have a harder time dealing with the realities of non-stimulated days. As I've mentioned earlier, the spiritual high wears off. And for someone who's experienced in a substance-induced setting, it only means that their experience was potentially a lot more potent than others who experience it naturally. This also means that their lows or come-down periods may feel much worse than someone who was never so high in the first place. It's actually quite simple. The higher you climb, the lower you fall. So that's a very important factor to ponder on as well. I would suggest that if you were spiritually awoken while on drugs, you should right away tap into the awakening and energy of the spiritual high and use that to learn all about spirituality from a natural standpoint. If you begin to repeat the drug use in order to reach those spiritual windows, it will ultimately come to a bitter end. Spirituality and materialism are like oil and water. They are mutually exclusive. From a spiritual perspective, this method of induced spiritual awakening is a formula that will not work forever. You cannot experience healthy, kosher spirituality your whole life if it depends on material stimulation. It has to be transitioned into a naturally induced high. But what are some of the warnings with regards to extremism for the individual in this category? Well, luckily for this individual, the drug was a cause for the effect meaning that he had the awakening in part due to the drug. This also means that this individual has not yet been exposed to spiritual teachings. Of course, that's not always the case, because perhaps this individual took a drug and, while on the drug, was exposed to some kind of teaching or lesson which helped contribute to his spiritual epiphany. But for now... I'll just deal with this case under the assumption that the individual has not yet had contact with spiritual teachings. If the case for you is twofold, as I mentioned above, then you will simply have to listen on and combine the warnings of two case studies. The individual in this category needs to be aware of the basics. And these basics will actually apply to all individuals from every category. 
but some of the other categories have their unique points that need to be stressed. The basics are as follows. Number one, you have a spiritual awakening or are somehow connected to spirituality. Number two, this leads you to want to learn more, find the truth, or be a better person. How you go about learning spirituality and incorporating it into your life is where most people differ. And this is one of the most important things that need to be carefully thought through. As I explained earlier, its consequences are life and death. Spiritual and emotional life and death, that is. From here, we have four different routes, which usually play out all scenarios. Route A. Some people hit the web, jumping from Google links to YouTube to religious sites to conspiracy theories to everything under the sun. These people are exposed to God knows what, good and bad. Their brains are stimulated by finally being mature enough to care about truth, emotional stability, and happiness. Little do they know that they are potentially wasting their time because it will all amount to nothing eventually. B. Other people gravitate towards leadership and submissiveness. They bind themselves to someone who can show them the way, subjugating themselves from their past life and starting anew. C. Some individuals connect with certain teachings or teacher and listen to his or her lessons remotely, either on CDs, books, videos, or podcasts. D. While others still don't really make much headway in getting educated. They simply build out their own philosophies of truth and morality. The basics that I just listed pretty much encompass most individuals that get involved with spirituality or spiritual teachings. Step one and step two are fine, but before we get involved or choose from route A, B, C, or D, we need to think carefully. Route A is very common. Jump on the web. Your mind, if intrigued, will want to inhale all the knowledge that you can. But that's a problem. There is way too much junk online and it's hardly probable that you'll only land on truthful stuff. Judaism is very big on connecting to an outlook or choosing a path for this reason. The lone individual who guides him or herself is bound to derail at some point. Here I would suggest that you be careful. Ponder with caution. Remember, you cannot undo what you've been exposed to or what you've chosen to put into your brain. You'd be much better off seeking guidance from a reputable spiritual guide than trying to find your own content to indulge in. If that's not going to happen, I'll suggest this. Take it easy. Balance tells us to take baby steps. It is all too easy to fall into the stupidest conspiracy theories online. Or follow the most extreme religious nuts. They cater to and prey on the inexperienced. Just take it easy. Remember that you will not become a tzaddik, a pious person, overnight. Character refinement and self-discipline takes years and years to master. Do not get ahead of yourself. My rule of thumb for taking baby steps is similar to the 10x rule. However much you'd like to undertake, do 10 times less. Progress at a pace 10 times smaller than your brain is telling you to. The reason for this is twofold. One because newcomers get ahead of themselves. Everything looks all glorious, but after undertaking too much, they often rebound too hard. Number two, the only way to achieve big spiritual heights is by taking it slow and doing things methodically. Nothing great comes out of impulsive, radical changes. Slow down, my friend. There's a reason why very few people make it to the top. It's not an overnight endeavor. No one is chasing you. It is so important to know this and remind ourselves throughout our spiritual journey. No one is chasing us. 
we have to operate under the assumption that time doesn't exist and that we have enough time to accomplish anything. That doesn't mean we should plunge into laziness and push things off. Hell no. It is just a mindset to keep us grounded and in touch with reality and where we are in life. Route B is also all too common, especially if you grew up ultra-Orthodox, falling into the submissive role or letting someone else lead your spiritual endeavors 100%. This has very significant ramifications that could be good or bad, depending on the leader and his true intentions. Hasidus puts great emphasis on being bitol to a true tzaddik, and many people are naturally drawn to these types. The warning here is that there are a lot of fakes. There are a lot of small-time holy people who operate quietly and suck in vulnerable individuals who take a liking to their awesome teachings and holy semantics. I am by no means downplaying the importance of connecting with a proper guide. Rabbi Nachman of Breslov stressed its importance like no other, and you know I follow the Breslov outlook. But what Rabbi Nachman also stressed is that finding a true tzaddik is a lifelong journey. And just when you think you've found an honest, holy individual, you may find out that he's bogus. We've all seen it too often. Rabbi Nachman also warns, not suggests, warns that we should not turn the tzaddik, the spiritual guide, into God. The whole point of getting close to a tzaddik is that he is supposed to bring us closer to Hashem. If your guide has any selfish traits or conducts himself in any way that suggests that he does things for his own glory, that should turn on their red flashing lights. With Route B, we need to be very careful about who we connect with. Generally, from what I've seen time and time again, tzaddikim that are all about Kabbalah and lure you in with mysticism and esoteric teachings don't usually pan out too well. And for some reason, newbies are overly attracted by that stuff. Be careful. And remember, baby steps. There's plenty to be intrigued by before falling into Kabbalah. In fact, all of Hasidic teachings is watered down Kabbalah. If you don't understand the basics of Hasidic outlook and Judaism, how in the world are you going to grasp any esoteric teachings? It's not for newcomers, as it's hardly for veterans. Route C which is remote learning. Now with technology and the internet, it's all too easy to find everything online, including your favorite lecture from your spiritual teacher. This can be great, but carries the same risks as Route A because it is online after all. And if you fall into the wrong hands, you may stay stuck there for a long time. There are a few warning signs when seeking out kosher guidance, and these should raise automatic red flags. Number one, Kabbalah. Anyone who bases all their endeavors and teachings on Kabbalah. Number two, anyone who tries to get you close to him and doesn't put the emphasis on God. Stay clear. Number three, anyone who makes you change who you are, how you dress and convinces you that your exterior is important, keep 200 feet away. Kosher guidance doesn't focus on exterior. Kosher guidance builds you from within. Number four, anyone who promotes arrogant teachings that gives you the impression that I'm better than you, don't waste your time. That's pure contamination. Number five, anyone who gossips, talks negatively about other sects or rabbis or talks down about other Jewish outlooks does not deserve your innocent soul. In Judaism, we believe in many paths. Anyone who knocks down one outlook over the other, or one sect over the other, is far from the truth. Route D can be seen a lot as well. 
This is where the individual wants to occupy his or herself in their own version of spiritual understanding and doesn't seek out the help or guidance of anyone else. This can sometimes be good, but more often leads to nothing great. The fact is, there is just too much nonsense and confusion in this world. The chances that you will spontaneously the chances that you will spontaneously come to understand things correctly usually doesn't work. I mean, if you were a progressive liberal atheist who believed that morality was created by humans, then perhaps your brain will find spiritual truth on its own. But according to the traditional teachings and the understanding of our sages, we don't believe that will be the case. More often than not, our own brain leads us to nonsense. Just look at all the nonsense we believed before we understood diseases and medicine. Our brains cannot simply determine truth from falsehood without relying on the individuals who master the appropriate subjects. I would suggest finding proper guidance for this individual. In general, I agree with the notion that we must choose a path in life, yes. It can be fun, even beneficial, to learn from many outlooks. You can take the good and leave the bad, but ultimately, in a religious or spiritual setting, you cannot build a consistent outlook or lifestyle based on scattered ideas. There has to be consistency and direction. Conclusion In conclusion, I would like to say a few things. 1. The spiritual high is a gift. It's a great energy that should be taken great advantage of. The best thing one can do is soak up as much spiritual knowledge as possible. This spiritual knowledge is a form of kalim, vessels, for when the high wears off. But you have to make it a point in your life to address and to deal with it correctly. Number two, it is all too common to fall by the spiritual wayside. This can happen for so many reasons, but one of them is that people just aren't taking things easy. They expect too much from themselves on the outset of their journey. This leaves an untold amount of people disappointed with their current stage and setting in life. Unsatisfied where they spiritually stand and where they seem to be headed. Stop it right now. Break that chain of thought. It is poisonous and nothing but a product of your evil inclination. Here's the truth. Our spiritual journey was never a black and white endeavor to begin with. Just 50 years ago, our parents and their parents thought and approached spirituality very differently. But things are changing. I know it's hard to balance the changing times and the onslaught of new perspectives, but God never gives us a challenge that we cannot handle. It is true that for thousands of years, Jewish outlook and spiritual practice was coated with a stern layer. Consequently, this has us battling to stay in touch with it. But all of that is changing now. As the world evolves, our understanding of spirituality does as well. And so it is time to shift that outlook into something more realistic and healthier. After all, isn't God behind the changing times? Our spiritual practices, our lifelong journey. It is something we should love and not resent. We should feel the same way about practicing spirituality as we do exercise or eating. I mean, when was the last time you rolled your eyes and said, Oi, I have to eat again, right? Usually the thought of having to eat again feels natural and is physically rewarding. We never give it two thoughts. We just go into the kitchen, whip up something, and eat, nourishing our body. Why should spiritual endeavors feel any different? Food for the soul should be just as, if not so much more rewarding than food for the body. Don't take the pressure, just take baby steps. If you feel overwhelmed, take a pause before the next baby step. Taking baby steps and staying away from the extremes is usually itself so rewarding it will probably never fail you. The only time it can annoy you is if you let it become a burden. It should never get there. 
It should always be something that you want and emotionally need. It should never become a hassle. It's time to rewire our brains. Viewing spirituality in the correct light will add more light to your life. Number three, balance is something we want to utilize in all areas of our life. It's there to stop us from being close-minded individuals. It's there to help us take a step back. Be open-minded. Progress with ease. Refrain from imposing our ideas on others and just let things be. Number four, this topic is dynamic. Fully explaining it with proper examples and case studies would take hours upon hours. Every section could have been greatly elaborated on and ground down, but I don't want to do that. I believe this subject is beyond important because it affects just about everyone who is not only starting their journey, but also everyone who has been on a spiritual journey for a while now. Everyone struggles with the subject matter. You'd be an angel if you were above it. Heck, even Rabbi Nachman himself struggled with a lot of the ideas mentioned above. Before I go, I just want to remind you of one thing. God loves you. He's incomprehensibly proud of you. And every tiny little stride you take in spiritual and emotional improvement is worth more than all the gold in this world. Be happy. Be grateful for where you are. And always, always remember where you are headed. Thank you for taking the time to listen to this podcast. If you have any questions, feel free to visit my website, faithisstrength.com dot com and fill out the contact form. I hope you enjoyed. Until next time.